A Rover's Story by Jasmine Warga. A first chapter Friday read aloud video and author interview with The Word Nerd. And as Eva, welcome to my channel Learning with the Word Nerd and another first chapter Friday video. This week I'm going to be reading to you from A Rover's Story. And if we zoom in on the cover, you can see this little black square says Advanced Reader's Edition, which means that I got a copy before it even went on sale. Publishers do this. We've talked about this a little bit before on the channel, but publishers do this to build up some buzz and excitement so that when the book comes out, everyone is just so excited to get it in their hands. Um, publishers have started sending me copies so that I can tell you guys all about them. And uh, it's just like a little treat in my mailbox. And I love it. I loved this book as well. And when I release this video on Friday, October 7th, uh, it will be out in the world and you too can get your hands on this copy. Um, throughout this book, the author Jasmine Warga has sprinkled all of these amazing behind the scenes notes um, to tell you about the story. And normally I would read those two because they're so great, but instead we get something even better. Today we're gonna get a chance to talk to Jasmine. Before we get to that, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to read you the first few pages, and then we will chat with her all about this amazing space-inspired story that will, it's just going to be great. It's going to be great. All right. Meet Resilience, a Mars rover determined to live up to his name. Res knows he was built to be a rational and impartial explorer of Mars, free from the dangers posed by human emotions. But he was also built to learn. And as he spends time in the lab with his hazmat-wearing scientists who assemble and train him, he finds himself developing human-like feelings. Perhaps there's a flaw in his programming. Feelings or not, launch day comes and Rez blasts off to Mars, accompanied by Fly, the friendly drone housed inside him. As Rez ventures across Mars, collecting rocks and soil in search of signs of water and ancient life, he frequently looks up at the night sky and wonders about the humans he has come to care for back on Earth. But Rez soon learns that Mars's terrain and climate are inhospitable, rife with dust storms and steep cliffs. As he navigates dangerous perils, he is tested in ways that go far beyond space exploration. Ultimately, Rez will have to decide how much he is willing to sacrifice to advance the mission. And in the process, he might just discover what it truly means to be a friend. A Rover Story by Jasmine Warga Part one, preparing. You can see these great illustrations. The illustrations were done by the same person who uh, did the art for this gorgeous cover. Tried to kind of match my outfit to it today. I don't have any space shirts or space earrings. I did wear my moon phase bracelet though. Um, not important. Let's get to the story. The first day. I'm not born in the way humans are, but there is beginning. Beeping, bright lights, a white room filled with figures in white hazmat suits. So much information to process, but I can handle it. I wake to knowledge. My circuits fire. The room cheers. A loud sound, but it does not startle me. I am not built for startling. I have been built for observation. In the sea of unknown figures, I focus on a face. I do not know if I have a face. If I have one, my information suggests it is not like this one. This face has what humans call lips. The human lips curl upward. A smile. I cannot smile, this I know, but somehow I understand the significance of this expression. I am learning. My mission has begun. Learning. I am built to collect and process information. That is how I learn. Here's some information I have collected. I am what's referred to as a robot. Most of the other beings around me are called humans. All the humans I interact with wear hazmat suits. This is to prevent microbacteria and dust particles from entering my environment. It is very important for my mission that I'm kept in a sterile and clean environment. For some reason that I do not quite understand yet, humans call the white hazmat suits they wear bunny suits. I do not know what a bunny is. I frequently wonder about the possibilities. Most of the humans in bunny suits are what humans term scientists. This I have deduced is a subset of human. Perhaps I'm a subset of robot. I do not know because I've not encountered enough robots to understand for sure. I will wait to find out, but waiting can be hard. Dear Rover, 
This text is written slightly different. You can see here is the chapter we were reading before, learning, and then you can see this page right here is slightly different. It kind of looks like handwriting, and that's because it's a letter. Dear Rover, my teacher, Miss Enos, asked us to write you a letter. She's really excited. She says you're going to an, you're going on an amazing mission where you're going to find out amazing things. Mrs. Enos really likes the word amazing. Mrs. Enos kept looking at me while she talked about you. She even asked me if I wanted to explain to the other kids what you were, and I really didn't. Not at all. No offense, but I'm already sick and tired of hearing about you all the time. Then she said, come on, Sophia, and I didn't want to disappoint Mrs. Zena, so I told everyone how you are a robot who was created to explore the planet of Mars so that we could understand its atmosphere and environment better. It's kind of a mouthful to say, you know? I also told them that you were engineered to be really smart and that you are learning new things every day. Like yesterday, Mom told me that your brain learned how to talk to your arm. My classmates had lots of questions, but I didn't know how to answer them. I bet Mom could, though. Anyway, Mrs. Enos wants us to enter the contest to name you. I'm not sure I'm going to enter, no offense, again, though I did enter. If I did enter, I would submit something awesome like Spicy Sparkle Dragon Blast. I know enough to know that you can't talk like humans do, but if you could, I think that you would tell me that you like that name. Okay, my hand is starting to hurt. I think I've written enough. And anyway, I don't even know if rovers can read. Maybe I'll ask Mom tonight. Bye, Sophia. Someday. One day, all of a sudden, I'm taken apart. It is not explained to me what is happening. It is also not explained to me when or if I will be put back together again. I would really like to be put back together again. Hello, I say. Please put me back together. No one responds. No one explains why this is happening. Once I'm disassembled, I'm left with only my brain, a computer sitting still, suspended on a long laboratory table. My cameras are gone, so my vision is gone too. I'm only able to sense and observe things through hearing. I listen as the hazmats move around me, running tests on all different body parts. Though these tests I begin to understand, it is through these tests I begin to better understand what's going on. Code is transmitted into my brain, and I welcome the communication. The code I receive asks me to do different things, such as move the part of my body the hazmats call my arm. My arm is, is no longer physically connected to me, but my brain is still able to control and monitor its movement. I understand when a test goes well, and I understand when a test fails. I do this by reading code. Of all the tests, the ones run on my cameras are my favorite, because when my cameras are on, I can once again visually process my surroundings. I can see. When my cameras are not being tested, there's only darkness. The darkness is an unfavorable condition for me. I do not like it at all. I've heard that the hazmats refer to my cameras as eyes. I do not know if this is an accurate term, but I have stored it into my memory. It is a term that I like because it makes me feel similar to the hazmats, and being a hazmat seems like a wonderful thing to be. The hazmats are not in pieces. All of their parts have been put together. The hazmats are able to move around us as they please. The hazmats are able to talk with one another. And the hazmats are never left alone in the darkness, unable to move. Have I mentioned that I'm unable to move? When I sit suspended on the table in the darkness, my brain cycles through many thoughts. Most of them are not enjoyable. But there is one enjoyable thought. This thought arises from listening to the hazmats. From information I have overheard, I have developed an understanding that someday, perhaps someday soon, I will be put together again. I like to think about this. It is a good thought. It is a good thought because it means someday I will be whole again, which means that someday I will be able to move. And best of all, someday I will be able to use my cameras at all times to see. I do not have the information that tells me when someday is when some day will be. All I can do is wait and listen. So I wait and I listen, but waiting is hard. I'm starting to think that I was not built for waiting. Reina, there's a large team of scientists who work with me. Humans would tell you that it is impossible for me to have a preference, that I am built to be an unbiased observer. Perhaps though there's a flaw in my code because I have some favorites among the hazmats. The first of which is Raina. Raina's in charge of running many of my tests. She writes the code that asks my arm to bend down and pick up an object. 
She writes the code that asks if I am able to see that she is testing my arm. It is nice to talk to Raina in this way, through code. Once, when Raina was running a test on my camera, I was able to see her. Beneath her white hazmat suit, I observed that she has light brown skin and hair with pigments of black and brown. Her eyes share similar pigments to her hair. I have memorized that image. I now associate that image with the sounds that Raina makes in the laboratory. Raina never calls a hazmat suit a bunny suit. Raina refers to everything by its correct terminology. I appreciate her precision. Raina is often the first figure I observe is often the first figure I observe when the day begins and often the last of the hazmats to leave the laboratory at night. Most of the time, I cannot actually visually process Raina since my camera, my eyes, are not currently connected to my brain, but I'm still able to perceive her. My brain is able to make other observations like sound and registering of presence to know that Raina is there. Raina has a very noticeable presence. Her behavior follows a clear pattern. Raina is rhythm and dependability. Raina is the sound of typing computer keys and measured answers full of exact calculations. Raina is elegantly written code without any of the problems that the hazmats call bugs. When Raina speaks in the language of humans, her voice is crisp and clear. Raina never talks directly to me in her clear and crisp voice, but I like listening to her talk to the other hazmats. She almost always has the answers they are looking for. When she does not, she promises to get back to them as soon as possible. As soon as possible is a phrase I have learned from Raina. I'm hoping that all my different body parts will be put together as soon as possible. Unfortunately, I'm not able to express this message to Raina because I am unable to talk in the language of humans. Raina only speaks to me through code and I can only answer her in code and only to answer the specific questions that she asks, like, can you tell I'm testing your arm? I'm able to say yes or no. I'm not able to ask her a question about her day. I'm not able to ask her when my body parts will be welded back together. I'm not able to tell her that waiting is hard. I do not have the ability of human speech. It seems unlikely that I will ever have the ability of human speech. That is a fact that frustrates me sometimes. Frustrate is another word I've learned from Raina. Sometimes when she is alone in the lab, she speaks to her, she speaks into her phone. She says things to her phone like, Mama, I know you are frustrated that I'm going to miss dinner again, but the work I'm doing here is really important. It made me feel important to hear Raina say that. It also made me forget about my frustration that I can't talk directly to Raina and my frustration that I'm still in pieces. At least it made me forget for a little. I would still like to be put together again as soon as possible. We've got another letter from Sophia next. Dear Rover, Mrs. Enos hadn't told us to write to you again, but I'm writing anyway. I don't know why. I guess I was feeling like I wanted to talk to someone. Tonight at dinner, I asked mom if Rovers could read. She told me, that's a great question that has lots of different answers, which is a very mom thing to say. CD told me to just give Sophia a straight answer, which made me laugh. CD is my grandma and I call her CT because that's the Arabic word for grandma. After dinner, mom went back to work. Does she talk to you when she's there? What does she say? Sometimes I struggle to fall asleep when mom isn't here. Once in a while, CD will come to my room and sing me a song. Occasionally, dad sneaks in and tells me a story about a giant that lives in the mountains or a cursed kingdom that gets saved by a princess. Dad always has the best stories, but no matter how good the story is, it's still hard to get to sleep when I know mom is gone. So maybe that's why I'm writing you now, because I miss mom and I know that you're with her. Say hi to her for me? I wonder how you say hi in robot. Maybe someday you can teach me. Your sleepy friend. Can I call you my friend? Sophia. Xander. <clears throat> Another scientist I've developed a preference for is named Xander. Xander works with Reyna. When Xander ran a test on one of my cameras, I observed that he has pale white skin, gray eyes, and hair that my system identifies as having both red and brown pigments. Xander is always moving. He frequently paces around the lab. Xander likes to call his hazmat suit a bunny suit. He likes to make what humans call jokes. Sometimes I understand the humor, sometimes I don't. It doesn't bother me too much when I don't understand though because Raina hardly ever seems to get Xander's jokes either. Why didn't the tree like the checkers? Xander says to Raina while she's checking the code that will help me steer once I'm connected to my wheels again. I don't know what you're saying, Raina answers. Because it was a chess tree. Xander laughs and Raina does not. Get it? 
Xanderat says. Reyna does not reply. She just keeps typing. But even though I frequently do not understand Xander's human, I like him very much. I feel quite connected to him. Perhaps it's because Xander is the one who informs me of my name. We are all alone when he tells me. No one else is in the room, not even Reyna. A sixth grader in Ohio wrote this, he says. Even though I can't visually see him, I detect that he is reading off a tablet. Almost all the hazmat suits carry tablets. Tablets, I've come to understand, are small computers. I sometimes try to talk to the tablets. I've recently discovered that I'm able to talk to other machines. Reyna's phone is quite chatty. The tablets, though, are not great conversationalists. They are very focused on productivity. Let me read to you what the sixth grader wrote in her essay. It's wonderful, Xander says. I do not know what a sixth grader is. I do not know what Ohio is. But both words seem important. I store them in my system. Xander walks, his footstep making an echoing sound. He clears his throat and reads off his tablet. <clears throat> my name is Cadence, and I think you should name the new Mars rover Resilience. Resilience is a noun that means the power or ability to return to the original form after being bent, compressed, or stretched. It can also mean elasticity. There's another definition in which resilience means the ability to recover easily for adversity. The dictionary also says resilience can mean buoyancy, which is the ability to float. My science teacher told us that this Mars rover has a big task. It's going to collect samples from the surface of Mars, explore the terrain and photograph it, as well as try to bring back online another Mars rover who NASA lost connection with. To me, that sounds like a job that will need resilience. This rover will need to be able to stay afloat even when things are difficult. I have read that the landing can be especially tricky. I think having a name that means to float will be good luck for tricky landing. There will probably be lots of setbacks, but this rover will hopefully adapt. That is why I think you should name the Mars rover Resilience. Isn't that an awesome essay, buddy, Xander says? I observe that he's using buddy to refer to me. That means that I am Xander's buddy, and Xander is my buddy. I register this. So many people wrote to us, but of all the essays, this is the one that was chosen as the winner. Your name is Resilience but I think I'm gonna call you Rez for short. What do you think? He pauses for a second and then adds, Rez? He laughs. Maybe this is another one of his jokes. I'm not sure what is funny, but I like the sound of his laugh. He touches the main computer part of my body, my brain, with his gloved hand. I can sense it somehow, even though I can't see it. Perhaps the right way to phrase the sensation would be to say, I feel it. I am a Mars rover. My name is Resilience. My nickname is Rez. You are given a nickname when you have a buddy. I am Xander's buddy. I can feel it. All right, let's head over and have a conversation with the author Jasmine Warga and learn more about this amazing story. All right, readers, we are here with Jasmine Warga. Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us today for this interview. Awesome, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, um, I just read everybody the first, I think, like 15 pages of a rover story, so they know a little bit about the book. Um, but, and I told them there were, there were some really great author notes in the story that I didn't share with them. And one of the things I learned in that author's note is that this story was inspired by true events, both like in our news, but also in your personal life. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about like, how do you know when you get an idea um, that it's a good idea, like something happens in your regular life and you're like, ooh, that would be a good story. Like, how do you decide is that idea good enough to spend the next, you know, several months working on? Yeah, so that's a great question. And honestly, funny enough, I feel like for me, ideas do come in the shape of questions. And so for me, this book uh, first started with a question that my daughter asked me when we were watching um, the Mars rover launched together, the actual NASA rover launched in July of 2020. And I was watching it with my two daughters. And my youngest one is actually the one who asked me as she watched the rocket that was carrying the rover launch into the sky. She asked me if I thought the robot was scared. And I thought that was such a beautiful human question, right? Right away. Mm -hmm. I thought that's the type of question that a story is born out of. You know, is the robot scared? What does it mean to be scared? What does it mean to have human feelings? But I really didn't think I was going to write that book. I just thought that's a good idea. 
Um, but then it wouldn't let me go, right? The question started to grow tentacles and there were more questions. So I was like, wait, you know, how long does the rover exist on Earth before they go to Mars? And what other machines and people does the rover interact with on Earth? And so I wanted to know the answers to those questions. So I went on NASA's website and was just looking around. And the more I researched, the more questions came. So I learned really fun facts like that NASA always builds two identical rovers. And right away I saw there's some narrative mm -hmm. tension there. I loved reading about the relationship like the NASA scientists have to their rovers. And I think I was particularly, I'm always interested in family, right? And family relationships. And I was like, wow, this is such a different way to look at family. This is such a different way to look at belonging. And so to answer your question, I think for me, I, I don't really believe there are good and bad ideas, right? I think there are ideas that we are suited to write. And I think what makes us suited to write is that our curiosity continues and deepens. And so for me, that's how I know, as if an idea has momentum for me, if that initial question grows and continues to grow more questions and sort of pollinates itself as opposed to it feeling forced. Because I think sometimes I'll have ideas that objectively I feel like are good ideas. You know, they're marketable mm -hmm. ideas. They're what maybe in my like scheme of wearing an author hat in this publishing business thinks, oh, that's a good idea. I could see where that book would belong on a bookshelf. But the problem is it's not personally speaking to me. It's not exciting mm -hmm. me. Again, I'm not chasing it. And so for me, it's this question of, is it something that I'm going to want to know how this story ends? I'm going to want to know what happens because as a writer, you're not only the writer of the story, you're also the story's first reader. And so I think you have to be like, you have to engage your reader self in order to write the book. That makes so much sense. Absolutely. Um, so the book is about a true thing, a Mars rover. Um, but there are also some kind of science fiction elements in there where the robot begins to develop human feelings. Um, and again, in the author's note, you said that there are some places where you let your imagination leapfrog uh, scientific reality. And so how did you how did you balance how much was really true, really could happen with those kind of fantasy, you know, science fiction elements? Did you did you think about that balance as you were writing? Yeah, I mean, I definitely wanted the book to be rooted in scientific fact, but I didn't want fact to get in the way of narrative because I was in the business of writing a fiction book, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I've been thinking a lot about how when we're growing up, right, in school, or at least when I was in elementary school and in middle school, I was always taught that nonfiction was true and fiction was fake or make-believe, right? Yeah. Yep. And recently I've been thinking more along the lines of, I think when we talk to kids, I like to say, and I'm going to say in my present school presentations for a rover story, that nonfiction is about learning through facts and fiction is about learning through imagination. And to me, that's where I love working on this book, that there are lots of real world facts. But I think also, well, certain things are a stretch from where science is now, and I call those things out in the back of the book. There's also so much learning that I hope can happen for kids in terms of wonder and the possibility of what could be true and social emotional learning and all of those types of things. And so to me, this book kind of sits at that intersection between mm -hmm. fact and fiction. And so definitely like I wanted the sort of general vibe of the rover to be as accurate as possible. Um, I based a lot of resiliences, that's the name of the rover in the book, his capabilities off of Perseverance, who is NASA's new rover. Um, Perseverance has a drone helicopter that is with them on Mars. Uh, Perseverance's helicopter is named Ingenuity. The helicop drone helicopter in the book, my character is named Fly. Now, do I know what Perseverance's relationship is with Ingenuity? Of course not. So, you know, Resilience's relationship with Fly, that's where the fiction piece comes in. But that's what mm -hmm. I think is so fun is I took some like real world facts and then sort of let my imagination run wild in the hopes of sort of trying to encourage young readers to think about that too, how sometimes like learning facts um, can be fun, can be exciting yeah. uh, for our world to then kind of d daydream about that. And I don't feel like we need to necessarily silo those things as much as I feel like at least I was taught to do when I was a kid. 
Yeah. And as you were talking, it reminded me, like, we do this a lot with historical fiction. Like, we take real things that happened in the past and we write stories about them and then authors be like, okay, this was real and this was made up and whatever. Um, it's really fun to think about science fiction or or fiction in a different realm, uh, kind of in that same way. So good job for trying something uh, at least new to me. I liked it very much. Um, hey. Okay, so Rover, um, the Rover uh, Resilience is trying to, he's picking up these human emotions. He's learning about human emotions as he goes. He doesn't necessarily think this was his purpose, um, but he is nonetheless. And as I was reading it, I was like, this is so amazing because as Resilience is learning these emotions, readers are learning these emotions too. And I know that, um, you know, social emotional learning is like such a big thing in school these days. Um, and so if we had a chat a little bit about this on Instagram, as I was reading, I was like, wait, did you do this on purpose? Like, um, and so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I was writing the book. I started writing the book in 2020 and I feel like being a young person is always hard, right? But I feel like being a young person in the middle of a pandemic, especially toward the beginning when we had no idea what was going on, we had no idea what the world was going to continue to look like. There was just a lot of emotions. All of us were feeling a lot of emotions, especially young people. And I feel like some of those emotions, like I feel lonely or I feel trapped or I feel happy to be at home with my family, but also lonely because I'm missing my friends. Like lots of conflicting emotions are difficult and it can be difficult to find the emotional vocabulary to talk about feelings. You know, I, as a grown up person, still find it difficult sometimes to label and figure out my emotions, especially when I feel like I'm feeling lots of different things. And sometimes we'll feel like I'm feeling the wrong thing of what I should be feeling. And so for me, it was kind of fun to look at emotions from this perspective of resilience who's sort of new to that and to sort yeah. of try to think about, well, what does it really mean to be happy? What does that look like? And it was such a writerly challenge because oftentimes I've come from writing human characters, right? So the physical qualities that I would ascribe to emotions like a heart racing or clenching your fists or feeling your stomach flip, all those descriptions are out the window, right? So I have to really think about okay, if I take like anger down to its essence, what does that look like? And how does that feel for a robot who doesn't live in the same body as I do? But my hope is that the book can kind of provide this blueprint um, for young readers who read it to really kind of think about their emotions and think about what um, it means to have those emotions. I mean, returning back to kind of the the first seat of the book and, and my young daughter asking me, you know, do you think the robot's scared? And this idea of, well, what does it mean how, what does it mean to be scared and how sometimes like being scared and being brave exist in the same moment, mm -hmm. right? And I think that those were things that I wanted to explore and kind of provide a framework uh, to talk about. So I definitely think it's funny that in some ways my like robot story is my most like emotion forward uh, book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did great. Pull it off completely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Sophia's letters. Um, I loved them and I was at first surprised at their inclusion. And I am curious, were, was Sophia and, and her letters always a part of the narrative and a part of the draft or uh, did they come in later? Yeah, so they were not originally a part of the book. Um, you know, my editor and publishing team really felt like they wanted to have a child perspective since it's a middle grade novel. And at first I was really resistant to that because I thought, no, like the whole idea is that resilience is our character and that's kind of like the stand in. And I was sort of thinking about it in that sort of Pixar movie way, right? Of like mm -hmm. kids link into Woody and Buzz. But then we also do have Andy, right? There is like this, this kid as the framework. And so I started to open myself up maybe to the possibility. And now I'm so glad. It was really my editor who was like, I just think that's going to give the book an extra dimension. And actually, I think it really helped me because this is a book that happens over a really long period of time, um, which also makes it very different from um, most traditional middle grade novels and most middle grade novels that I've written. Because usually you're kind of confined, right, to your protagonist being between the ages of 10 and, and 13 maybe at, at max. So you're not going to have a lot of 
years. And this is a book that stretches over lots and lots of years. And Sophia's letters were sort of a way to do that. And also, I think, a way to open up showing a different side of the NASA scientists who are also main characters in the book, because resilience is only able to see them in the lab, right? But this idea of like, what does their life look like at home? And that was something I was really interested in, um, too. So I ended up coming around and really like enjoying uh, adding in Sophia's uh, perspective. But um, my editor was right, as she almost always <laughs> did. It was just figuring out um, sort of how how to do that. Yeah, well, um, I love them. I think they're a great inclusion. Any, I love stories that are told in letters. So um, that's really good. Okay, I have to cheat. I forgot my last question. Um, cool. we kind of touched on this a little bit too. Um, so you wrote most of this book during the pandemic, like the thick of the stay at home, like when we were still all really just, we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you use writing to help you in a hard time? Yeah, so for me, I think I've always, writing has always been this place that I search to, to grapple with the big questions that I have about the world. But this book in particular was something different that it was also sort of like an escape for me because I think that at this moment, you know, I'm stuck in my house. I'm feeling kind of really icky. I don't know what's going on in the world. And so I got to go to space, right? I got to go to Mars. I got to go on this adventure. and I. But I also was wondering a lot about, you know, what does it mean to feel alone? What does it mean to feel separated from the people that you love? And so I think this book worked in both ways. It was a way for me to process some of the emotions I was having in 2020 and some of the emotions I know the people closest to me were having while also getting to kind of go on this fun adventure. And I guess that's kind of the synthesis of what I hope the book is for young readers. I hope it's like a fun adventure that they're able to get into at and at the same time is also a book that makes them sort of think more deeply about their emotional interior life and the interior emotional life of other people. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I said before, I absolutely loved it. And I think that readers are going to as well. Um, can you tell us quick before we go, uh, what are you working on next? And if readers have more questions, where would be the best place for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, so I am in the beginning stages of working on a new middle grade novel. I'd actually been working on a book for a long time and just a couple of weeks ago kind of figured out that I don't feel like it's going to work for the reasons we talked about earlier in this um, way of it just stopped being a book that was kind of generating more questions. So books are always difficult to write, right? I always don't really know where they're going. But if I don't feel like the book is asking something of me, it's really hard for me to continue. And I got to that point. So now I'm back to sort of reimagining and thinking about things, but I'm excited about this new thing that I'm chasing. Um, and so I guess what I would say is it's sort of, it's an, a middle grade adventure book that has a little bit of a feel of a fairy tale. So I'm, I'm excited about it. We'll see um, where it goes. I just, feel like there's very, it's so fragile right now that it's like very hard to even describe what it is yeah. I'm starting um, from scratch, but um, hopefully sometime I'll, I'll get to talk with you about it um, in more depth because it will actually be a book shape thing. Um, and then in terms of how to get in contact with me, so the best way to reach me is through email. I often miss like messages that are sent to me through social media because they get sort of lost in that Um abyss and things like that. So if you want to ask me questions, you can go to my website, jasminemorga.com, and it lists my email there. Um, and that's definitely the best way uh, to reach me at jasminemorgabooks at gmail.com. So I uh, would love to hear any like questions or comments you have about my books. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on this newest book. And uh, readers, will see you again next time. Happy reading. Awesome. Happy reading. To continue reading a Rover story by Jasmine Warga, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from a local indie bookstore like Boswell Books in Milwaukee, or find it via the link in the description box below. Then be sure to check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday videos I have for you on this playlist. Thanks so much for joining me on my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. I hope you'll come back again for more First Chapter Friday videos, brain breaks, and other great content. You can find me online at these places, which I've linked below. See you again next time and happy reading.